All right, let's sing Cornerstone together. Lord, we thank you that no matter what trials we face in this life, that we have a sure foundation. The immovable force in the universe is you. Lord, we can build our lives upon you. Lord, we know that our identity comes from you. Lord, we love the symbolism of what you've uh, done uh, through scripture. You talk about the cornerstone that the, the builders, they rejected and said, that's not the right one. No, you, Jesus, it's you. And, and we acknowledge you as Lord, that we can build our entire lives around you. Lord, without you, we just, again, we're, we're, we're stumbling through life trying to figure it all out. But, Lord, uh, we thank you that in you we have hope. In you we know that our future is secure, and you have promises for us. Lord, we are coming through a time right now in our world 
that's just been so chaotic and full of turmoil, and it seems as if uh, we're turning the corner when it comes to this virus. But Lord, I pray that even once it seems that that's all kind of done and long in the past, that we remember our dependency upon you, our need for you. Lord, that we crave you, that we seek you in all things, that we know that we can't simply do this life without you, that you are our hope that we need you desperately. So God, we uh, thank you. We've had time to sing. Is in Christ alone. I wish I could be here to hear everyone sing this one. This is one that everyone always sings from the heart. And um, it's just so great to hear the congregation sing along. I wish I could be there with you guys. Um, But I will imagine in my heart and in my ears that you guys are there singing with me. But let's sing um, in Christ alone. Let's sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. 
everybody. Welcome to Quail Lake Church Online. We haven't been with you for a couple of weeks. We've been out of town, been doing things, but we're back and we're ready to be with you today. Hey, we've got a message out of 2 Peter chapter 2, and this is really a powerful chapter. And the thing about it is that it was powerful in the time that it was written, like all scripture would be, but today you're going to think, wow, this was written for us. I, I mean, it is right off the front pages. And so we're going to take a look at this. Our title today is Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. Let's pray and we'll get into it. Father, thank you. You're a great and awesome God. And we thank you for this time together. Thank you for bringing us back together after a time away. And Lord, I pray for the folks that are out there and ask that you will just bring your blessing on them, encourage their hearts. I pray that you would just stand against the discouragement and, and Father, the, the hurt that we see so often in life. And I pray that you fill them with hope and, Father, with a great sense of your promise of the future. And, Lord, I pray today that you will touch them, bring your healing where it is needed, encouragement. Father, that you will bless them and that you will give them a new sense a new sense of your goodness and grace, but also of the great God you are. So teach us from your scriptures right now. I thank you for my friends, and I pray that you will do a good work in both of us, and we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, the title is Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. <clears throat> now, if you're kind of kind of my age group, that's something we used to do. Kids would always say that at school or or maybe in the playground or whatever, we were with a bunch of kids from the neighborhood. Somebody told a lie, or we thought they did. We'd all chant that, liar, liar, pants on fire. Well, you know, that was just kind of a little ditty that we had learned, and, and every kid would say. But, you know, after reading this chapter, I'm thinking, that's good theology. Uh, because we're going to be talking about liars here, people who tell untruths. And then the pants on fire? Well, God says destruction is coming for those people. There's judgment right around the corner. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at chapter 2, Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire, with 
these liars are among you. Starts this way, but there will also be false prophets as in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. And their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. I can remember back in the fourth grade, and it was probably around noontime. We had a recess after lunch, and we had a chance to play on the playground. We had a softball game we were going to play. We had all the equipment out there. A whole bunch of guys were there. We had some problems, though, with trying to decide, you know, was this person really out, or was that ball fair, and that kind of stuff. So we decided we needed an umpire. Guess who got elected umpire? Me. Now, I don't know if it was because they saw something in my character or thought that there was a spirit of fairness about me, or if neither team wanted me on their team and thought, well, give it to this guy. But I had seen umpires work. I'd played a little uh, baseball and stuff, and so I thought, I can do this. So we're getting to the end of the lunch hour. We got a guy on third. It's tied up. And by golly, a guy makes a hit. And it doesn't go very far. But that runner on third, he comes running into home plate. I'm behind home plate with the catcher. And they throw the ball to the catcher. And I see the catcher tag this guy out. That's what I saw. So I call him out. So it's game over. The guy goes ballistic. He says, no, no you got to believe me. I, I, I was safe. The guy never touched me. I never felt you. I saw it. It was never even close to me. I'd gone to school with this guy for five years already. And so I thought, oh, my goodness, I've made a mistake. So I'm a fourth grader. So I go, okay, you know what? He's safe. They win. Well, of course, a riot breaks out. But fortunately, we had to go back to class. And so we're walking back to class, and the guy comes up against me, and I said, wow, you know, I'm, I'm sure glad you told me about, you know, not being tagged out because uh, I, I, I didn't see that. And the kid turns to me and says, oh, no, he really tagged me out. I knew he had. I just told you that he missed me. And I stood there dumbfounded. I remember just stopping. I was pretty naive, but that's the first time that someone had openly, purposely, as far as I knew, lied to me and then casually admitted it without any responsibility or remorse. That's what people are capable of. I learned it that day, but it's seen, I've seen it over and over again. Peter brings us the bad news that there were religious liars in Israel, and now there are religious liars in the church. Now, they're not just out there. Uh, they are in the church, and people are listening to them. Now, there are lying religious teachers out there, and that's what the Bible says will happen more and more as we get closer to closing this journey we humans have had on earth. They lied in the Old Testament. They are lying in the New Testament. They lie today. <clears throat> now, you say, well, why? why would they do that? The thing you have to remember, and Peter really described it here. I, he was right on the money, literally, because he says there's always a benefit to the liar. And he said money and power, notoriety, all of these things. Now, if you go through the Old Testament, you'll find that there were real prophets. And there were those who had nothing to do with God and sought to pull people in a totally different direction. So Peter's Peter's not saying this is a possibility. You know, one day there might be people who would mislead you or, or you know, or, or maybe in your dreams that, no, no, he's more, it's happening right now. Happening right now. Now, we have that today, right here in the United States. It started in the United States. Uh, I can think of uh, two, different, two different groups, and, and both of them looked at Christianity years ago and said, the church is in a horrible condition. The people aren't obeying God the way they need to. So everybody said, yeah, you're right. Those Christians aren't doing what they're supposed to do. They're not living like they're supposed to do. So these two groups, uh, 
among many others, but these two groups, they said, we know what God wants. And the problem was they began to teach something that wasn't in the Bible. They had to create their own holy books, their own literature, all of these things. And where they made their attacks, and I don't know if you caught that in the scripture there, uh, Peter was saying, it says, you know, they turn on the one who redeemed them. Their first attack is on the person of Jesus Christ. Now, they would say, oh, no, we're honoring him. Well, one of these groups, you know what they do? They claim that Jesus is Satan's brother. Not God. He's just Satan's brother. I don't think so. That's not what Scripture says. There's nothing in Scripture to be even close to that. Another claims that he was a created God. We needed another God, so he got created. He's not God as the Bible teaches. He's just, just a God that we've got out there. And so that's just a part of what we see right here around us that's a part of our fabric here in America. And that's just a sampling of what Peter sees in his world and what was to come in ours. But what's happening in our world now is not just a dumbing down of the personhood, the godhood of Jesus, of the Bible, but there's teaching in churches that say that God has called some behaviors sinful. And, and you know what? And they were wrong. God was wrong. This is good stuff. The Bible and God had it wrong all the time. They just didn't know. And we're told that we can all be thankful now that we've progressed so much that we know now that real sin, the real sin in our world, is your narrow view of sex and sexual practices. Not the stuff that's being force fed to us and to our kids by those who want to do what God has said no to. We're not doing this. God's the one that said it. Why do they do this? Why do they do this? Peter says something here that we have to remember that cuts to the heart of this issue. He said this. If you open your Bible to that chapter, you'll find this. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money. When you see people out there who have that kind of agenda, and it's universal. I mean, it's, it's in government, religion, uh, politics, activism, all of that. All of that. The same principle holds true. So often their passion and even morality of people becomes influenced by who will bring me wealth and power. And they'll always believe that I'm sacrificing myself for you, for you poor people who can't think for yourselves. And, and, and we ask you not to think for yourselves because, you know, we don't trust you. Uh, when in doubt, follow the money. That's what Peter is saying. Follow the money. Peter says they'll make up clever lies to get hold of your money. And then he says something kind of chilling here. And when you read this, you ought to kind of catch your breath. It's in the last part of verse 3. It says, but God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. Now, we're talking about teachers in the church, not just people. It includes them, but it's teachers he's focusing on. But the liars, they're not just human. And he goes on, because he says, these liars are spirit and flesh. Verse 4, for God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they're being held until the day of judgment. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around them. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of judgment. Well, he's especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. These people are proud and arrogant, daring even to scoff at supernatural beings without so much as trembling. 
But the angels, who are far greater in power and strength, do not dare to bring from the Lord a charge of blasphemy against those spiritual beings. All right, we got some explaining to do here, don't we? Peter begins listening here. Who got caught in the lies and have already paid for it? First, he says, angels, angels who sinned, rebelled against God. You know, when we talk about creation, everything else, that's not the beginning of the story. That's the beginning of us. There's something else that's taken place. There's a rebellion against God from created beings. He says, some are thrown into hell. Already? Yep. Literally, it says, he has delivered them into chains of darkness, and they are reserved for judgment. That's the literal stuff says. Now, we know that some of these bad actors are still out there influencing people. So apparently from this, what we're seeing is that some of the rebelling angels are still active among us. That's the demonic. And the rest are in kind of a massive detention camp or something. And maybe their number was limited. Maybe that happened just so we didn't get overwhelmed. Who knows? But that's what's out there, he says. That's what's going on. They got their shot, and some are paying already. And others, they'll be joining them. And then we're going to have final judgment. Well, then he goes on to people. He says, what about Noah? He said, remember, Noah was in a world that was so bad, so bad. God says, we just got to we gotta clean the slate, start all over again. You know, we're not talking about it. thinning the herd. No. As a matter of fact, it was so bad, he only saves eight of them. Why did he hate all those people? He didn't. He didn't. He loved all of them. Everybody, even the evil people. But he says, no, we're going to reboot this thing. And you know what? Everybody had a chance to be on that boat. Everybody had a chance to repent to God. God started that process. He went for 120 years. 120 years. And so, uh, you know, maybe the building of the ark was maybe 50 years, 75 years. You know, we don't know. It doesn't even say that. But it was 120 years that passed from the time that God said, this is what I'm going to do. And that he said, we're going to do it now. And all that time, people saw Noah. Noah, it says, warned. It says here, Noah warned them about God's righteousness, about what God wants. Why so long? To give people a chance to change. To change, to repent, to listen to God. Over a century. And live like God had instructed them. How many responded? Eight. Eight out of the whole world. So, destroy the whole world of ungodly people with a flood. That's it. Judgment. Then, Peter takes us to Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, right off. He turns those cities into heaps of ashes. Why? Because they thumb their noses at God. But there's one godly man in the city of Sodom, in his family. He's righteous. He lived like God wanted him to live. And he was sick, it says, of the immorality around him. He knew that's not what God wants. And he repeats that for us. He says that Lot was tormented by what he saw every single day. Now, why, why, why is Peter telling us all this stuff? Well, I don't know. Well, what we're seeing here is for Noah and for Lot is that God knows how to rescue people from trial. And he knows how to keep wicked people under judgment until the final judgment. See, we're not even talking about final judgment yet. Now, you say, wow, okay, well, how do we get here? Well, remember what we're doing. We're being warned about false teachers in the church. And the key thing about the false teachers is that they don't respect any authority. Now, we're not talking about just you know, church authority, a board or something. No, we're talking about God. We're talking about God. And, and, and just saying, no, we don't respect God. And he says, you know, false teachers, they live by lust. They love it. They teach it. They approve of it. And they don't want any, any kind of interference from anyone else. They have become God. That's it. It's self-indulgence. And it says they'll slander spiritual realities. Uh, they don't get what the Bible says about even Satan's power. Of who he is, so they're just kind of half-hearted. Yeah, it's nothing like that, and and you know he says, yeah, we you know we'll go get that old devil and all that kind of stuff, but uh, but they deny his real influence in their own lives. And then in verse eleven, something that reminds us here 
uh, that, uh, you know, about us, that we need to know that we're people under authority. And so he says, no, you know, not even angels, not even you folks accuse Satan in our own power. That's God's job. We struggle with Satan and the false teachers. They take the role of God and the way they approach both Satan and God is almost the same. They don't take either one of them seriously. And the way they show that is by the way they live their lives. Disregard for God. And they flaunt God's rightful authority. So that's the rebellion. That's the rebellion that's going on. So that's what you see in the false teachers. It's a sense of rebellion. I'm going to be God. I'm going to run it. But I'm going to teach you and make you do what I do. So what's going to happen to these folks who do this? Next step, the liars, the liars are going to be destroyed. This is how it goes, verse 12. These false teachers are like unthinking animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed. They scoff at things they do not understand, and like animals, they'll be destroyed. Their destruction is their reward for the harm that they have done. They love to indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight. <clears throat> they are a disgrace and a stain among you. They delight in deception even as they eat with you in your fellowship meals. They commit adultery with their eyes and their desire for sin is never satisfied. They lure unstable people into sin and they are well trained in greed. They live under God's curse. They have wandered off the right road, followed the footsteps of Balaam of Baor, who loved to earn money by doing wrong. But Balaam was stopped from his mad course when his donkey rebuked him with a human voice. These people are as useless as dried up springs or a mist blown away by the wind. They're doomed to blackest darkness. They brag about themselves with empty, foolish boasting. With an appeal to twisted sexual desires, they lure back into sin those who have barely escaped from a lifestyle of deception. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption. For you are a slave to whatever controls you. You. That's what the Bible is telling us right here. So, all right, who, what do we do here? Well, let's first take a look. What, what, what do we see in these people here? Listen to how he describes them. Unthinking animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, scoff at things they don't understand, destructions their reward, indulge in evil pleasures in broad daylight, delight in deception even as they eat with you. Commit adultery with their eyes. Uh, they, they lure unstable people into sin. They're trained in greed. That's who they are. That's who they are. Yeah, Peter's coming on pretty strong, isn't he? Well, that's it. This is the Bible speaking. Well, then he talks about Balaam. Balaam. Now, Balaam's a great example of this whole thing. Now, Balaam, you've got to go all the way back to the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers. We find Balaam there. Balaam is a prophet. Not really a prophet of God. As a matter of fact, somebody described him as a wicked prophet in the Bible. And uh, he was wicked, but here's the thing. He wasn't false. He wasn't a false prophet because he did hear from God. <clears throat> and God did give him some true prophecies to speak. His heart wasn't with God. And eventually he showed his true colors by betraying Israel. What happened is Israel, they're coming into the promised land. And they have to come right up next to Moab. And the king of Moab sees this mass of people. We don't know how many hundreds of thousands there were. But, I mean, this is a whole bunch of folks coming this way. And he's just panicking. They're going to take his country. You know, they're crowding in on him already. And so he comes to Balaam, and he decides that he wants Balaam to curse these people, pronounce a curse on them. So um, he goes to Balaam, and he hires him. He says, you curse these people, you're going to get a big reward. Balaam says, I'm your man. I'm your man. But here's the problem. He says, I need God's permission to curse his own people. He says, I, I don't have any power. It's God's power. Balaam at least understood that. Uh, <clears throat> so he goes to God, and he says, all right, how about cursing these people? God, God says, no, we're not going to do that. Well, they come back to Balaam, the king and his people. Uh, Balak was the king, and, and they bring more money, more treasure and stuff. Come on, just curse these people. 
And so God says, okay, I'll tell you what. He says, go with these guys. Just go with them. But you do what I tell you to do. So Balaam saddles his donkey, heads for the country of Moab. Now, as he's going there, God sends an angel, an angel to block him, to only go so far and then block him, to oppose Balaam on the way. Now, the crazy thing is, he's on his donkey, he's riding along, an angel is there. We're not talking about this fat baby in a diaper, you know. No, that's not it. They're, they're fearsome folks, the, these angels that come. And, and so the donkey apparently could see the angel. But Balaam could not. So the donkey keeps stopping and pushing Balaam up against a ridge here. And he's scraping him up against the rocks and stuff. And, and Balaam, every time he does that, he beats the donkey. He's yelling at his donkey. He beats him. He does it three different times. <clears throat> After the third time, God does <clears throat> just the best thing in the world. He gives the donkey the gift of speech. The donkey, he's been whacking here. He turns around and he, the donkey says, Hey, don't do that to me. Can't you see what I see? You're about to die here, partner. And all of a sudden, Balaam can see the angel. And that's when the angel speaks. And the angel says, I'm sent here to kill you. What? Yep, you come this far, you come any farther, I'm going to take your life. You keep going. But the angel says, the donkey here saved you. And he says, now, what you're to do is speak only what God tells you to speak concerning the people of Israel. So he goes back. So King Balak takes Balaam up to a high place. He still wants to make this deal work. Balaam, of course, he wants to get the money, get all the goodies the king has. So they go up to this high mountain. They can look and they can see all the people of Israel down there below. And he says, all right, now I want you to curse Israel. And so he begins to speak. It doesn't come out of curse. It comes out of blessing. It comes out of blessing. He says, what are you doing? He says, I can't help it. That's just what came out. He says, let's go to a different place. Takes him to a different mountain. They go to a different mountain. They head up over there. And what happens is, is that he does the same thing. That he, he's there and he's going to give a curse. And he goes and he does a blessing instead. That's the second time. Now the king says, if you're going to keep on blessing, you might as well just shut up. Just shut up. The king is going, no, I, we got we to curse these guys. So he takes them to one more high place. And again, they do the sacrifices. They, uh, the, he's got the curse ready to go. And so, all right, Balaam, do it. And Balaam looks at the people and a blessing comes out. And the king is beside himself. Right on the spot, he fires Balaam. I mean, you're not putting that. He just fires him. You're fired. Go. No reward for you. And, and, and Balaam says, well, I told you. All I can do is what God tells me. And then he says, I've got more prophecies for you. This is just really cool. And there are four more prophecies. Free of charge, king. And he begins. And this is what God tells him. First, a star will come out of Jacob, right down to the people. Star, Christmas. A scepter will rise out of Israel, the Messiah. And what he will do? He will crush the foreheads of Moab. Sorry, king of Moab. And then the skulls of the people of Shem. He will conquer all. So the end result, he gave seven blessings on Israel, and God's enemies ended up being cursed. Well, he thought, what are we going to do? Balaam still wants this reward. This doesn't end. So he, he goes to Balak and says, I know what we can do. I know what we can do. How we can do it without doing the blessing and cursing thing. He says, you know what you do? You just go down there, you know, do this idol worship stuff you guys do. Bring the idols down there. Bring the prostitutes that go with it. Get them involved in worshiping this God. Everybody loves a good time. Balaam wasn't allowed to curse Israel directly. But he set it up so the people of God brought a curse on themselves. And they did it. Balak followed Balaam's advice. Israel fell into sin. They began worshiping Baal, false god, of Peor. They had all kinds of sex with Midianite women. 
And for this, God gave him a plague. 24,000 men died. Peter says, hey, you know what? This is what we're looking at. Peter uses this account from the book of Numbers in the Old Testament because that's the template. That's how this always works. The false teachers in the church, and they are there, and those who are out in the world, you know, it applies to that too, they end up following the same plan that, that Balaam had. He can't force you to abandon God and to follow them. But what they can do and what we see them doing inside the church and outside the church is cause you to walk away with the temptation of sex and abandonment of godly authority. Give up on God, go for the sex. Welcome to 2024. That's God. That's it. You see, this principle is still worked out. Still worked out. The ones who do this, though, he says, are already doing it. They want to lead you into sin, and those who have escaped from a destructive life of sin, they're going to try to get you back. And the promise over the centuries is always the same. Freedom. Come and do what I do, and you'll have freedom at last. He says they're not free. They're slaves. Slaves of sin and corruption. Because you're a slave to whatever corrupts you, whatever holds you. It's us who are set free in Christ who are really free. But you see, with that freedom we have in Christ, is this freedom from sin, not freedom to do sin. We still do it, but that's not why he set us free. So he closes with this. He says, these liars are rescued, and then they will fall again. And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and then getting tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they're worse off than before. It would be better if they'd never known the way to righteousness than to know it and reject the command uh, that they were given to live a holy life. They prove the truth of the proverb. A dog returns to its vomit. Another that says, the washed pig returns to the mud. And that's how he ends the chapter. Now, there are a lot of general principles here that apply to a lot of people out there. But the real target of all this and the warning is the false teachers of the church. Now, these folks had identified themselves as believers, these people. But they got tangled up in their old sin again. And the real danger here is that they not only refused God's help and forgiveness, they taught others to follow them and to respond to God in the same way. And Peter says that ignorance would have been better than apostasy, than turning your back on God never to return. He said it would have been better if you'd never known God's truth rather than deliberately trashing His grace and love and forgiveness by rejecting Him and what He's taught us. But then there's that last verse, and he's saying, those who know the truth and turn from it, he says, they're the lowest of the low. That's the lowest of the low. See, for Jewish people, there were two animals that were the lowest that you could just think about. Dogs and pigs. That's what he uses here. That's what he uses here. He says, these people who do this kind of stuff, they're like dogs who return to their own vomit. And a pig who gets washed up, it goes right back to the mud. You see, you can follow all the rules of the faith. You can walk and look and talk like a believer. But you know what? If you've never had Christ change your heart, you're just going through the motions. And your old life will start looking so good that you go back again. So, question is, what do we do with that? He's given us a lot of stuff. Boy, you talk about stuff that, man, it's just hotter than, than, than a pistol here. First, you've got to remember, Jesus is giving Peter two jobs here. Two jobs. One, feed the flock. Second, warn the flock. We see him feed the flock. We see that at the end of the ministry here. The resurrection has taken place. He tells Peter, you're supposed to feed the flock. That's going to be your job. And now he's being told, you warn the flock. The problem is, if you only feed the flock, you know what you're doing? All you're doing is fattening it up for the kill. So, they're false teachers. How do you know what is really true? Now, how do you know what I've told you today is true? How do you know I'm not purposely lying to you? Or, or that I'm just so mixed up and honestly thought I was giving you the right stuff, gave you the wrong information. How can you know? How can anyone know? Oh, please, you know what to do. Open that Bible. Get to know what's in there. 
And that's the operations manual for humans as we journey onward. We're becoming uh, like men who get something in a box that needs to be assembled. Have you done that? I've done that on Christmas Eve when my kids were little. And instead of reading the instructions, I'm going to do it on my own because I know the fast way to do it. Never worked. Why did I do that? I'm lazy. So what do you do? The Bible tells us what we're to do. And I tell my folks right here when they're sitting in this chapel, do this. You go check what I just said in the Bible. See if it's true. What you follow is the example from Acts chapter 17, verse 10. Write that down. Acts 17, 10. It says, that very night the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. When they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they listened eagerly to Paul's message. And this, they searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. And as a result, many Jews believed, as did many of the prominent Greek women and men. When we're talking about finding the truth, we're not just picking up a few verses here and there, you know, just kind of say, well, this is going to be truth and, you know, and all that. The problem with that is you need to know the whole Bible. You need to know everything that God is talking about. Otherwise, when you just pick out individual scriptures, you can make them say a lot of stuff. And you end up like the guy who, who comes to God and says, God, I, I, I don't know what to do with my life. And, and so he comes up with this plan that what he's going to do is he's going to take his Bible and just drop it and let it open up and put his finger down. And whatever his finger falls on, that's what God wants him to do. So he does it. He takes a Bible, drops it, puts his finger on it, and he reads this verse. Judas went out and hanged himself. He thought, wait, that can't possibly be right. So he shuffles the pages again and, and puts his finger there and and, and, and he gets something from Jesus. He can tell it's from Jesus. And it says, and Jesus said, whatever you must do, go do quickly. You think that's really God talking to you? No, it's not. You see, Satan will use the misuse of Scripture to keep his lie going. He's done that before. And you see the example of that in the temptation of Jesus. Check it out in Matthew 4, Luke 4. It's there. Satan uses both the Scriptures themselves and scriptural truths against Jesus. And Jesus, he uses the scriptures in the right context of what they are truly meant to say. Your Bible is the best defense. Like any instruction manual, it has to be read and remembered and understood. So keep reading your Bible. The Apostle Paul said the same thing that Peter is saying. He wrote to his co-worker Timothy this, but evil people and imposters will flourish. They'll deceive others and they themselves will be deceived. But you must remain faithful to the things you've been taught. You know they're true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. And he says, you have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong, teaches us what to do what is right, and God uses it to prepare and equip his people for every good work. Second Timothy chapter 3. Just before his death, W.C. Fields, a great actor and comedian of the last century, was in his hospital room. And uh, he was there and friends would drop by just to see how he was doing. One came in and he walks in and W.C. Fields is there and he's reading a Bible. He's kind of thumbing through the pages. And the guy was just stunned. He goes, Bill, what are you doing? You're reading the Bible. Now, W.C. Fields was no friend of Christianity. <laughs> and W.C. Fields closes the Bible like this, and he goes, all I'm doing is looking for loopholes. Just looking for loopholes. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. There are no loopholes. It's heaven or hell. We've got the legitimate rescue plan. It's Jesus alone. Nothing else. Don't let anybody say anything different. Let's pray. Father, thank you. You're a great and awesome God. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you that we can know the truth, that it's there for us. And I pray that you'll bring us to godly leaders and that, Lord, uh, that you'll make those who are not godly leaders, who aren't teaching what your word says, Father, just fade away. And, and I pray that you'll protect your church. And I pray that you'll protect the folks out there. 
I pray they'll go and check out their Bibles, everything's been said today, and see what is the truth. Thank you, God, for your goodness and grace. And Father, I pray that you just remind them that all you need to do today to accept Jesus, to be in on this great rescue plan, is just come and say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I ask you to come in, forgive me, and I'm ready to follow you, ready to go after what you tell me to do, how to live, and Father, to look forward to heaven itself. When you do that, you made it. You're home. You're home. Thank you, Father, for your goodness and grace. Bless them now, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there it is, hotter than a firecracker, but that's chapter 2 of 2 Peter. Now, before we go, let me bless you, and uh, maybe one day we'll have you right here, and we'll get to bless you in person. For now, now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever and ever. Amen. God bless you all, and remember, God loves you, we love you too, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye for now. All right, let's sing How Great Is Our God. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice to